In this video, we're going to discuss antiderivatives. This is the first lesson in the first part of Unit 5 of Calculus 1. Throughout most of the first semester, we've been talking about derivatives of functions. <clears throat> and if you recall, the goal of differentiation is to find the derivative that we called f prime of a function f. If we work backwards, we call that anti-differentiation. So in a sense, we are given f prime, and we've got to go find the original function that would have produced the derivative f prime. Now this process of anti-differentiation is not exclusive to existing derivatives. Sometimes we're given an actual function and it's beneficial to find the antiderivative of it. Uh, we don't usually use the f prime notation for our given information. Instead, uh, we're given a function f as we were before and we're looking for the antiderivative and we identify the antiderivative with a capital F. So in the first half of the class, we were given f of x, and we would find f prime of x. Now we're given f of x, and the antiderivative would be capital F of x. And so the formal definition is as follows. A function capital F is an antiderivative of f on an interval or domain, domain of values, uh, provided that the derivative of the antiderivative is equal to the original function for all x that are in that interval, for all values that are in that interval. And so what this antiderivative business does is it, it essentially makes us think backwards. And I had mentioned in class that we undo most of the work that we've already done for, mo for this first semester, but um, I don't really mean that we undo and throw it out. I think, I think what I meant to say was that we have to work backwards or if we think of all of the steps that we go through to create a derivative, we undo them by working backwards to find the antiderivative or the original function in the problem. So one of our first derivative rules was that the derivative of x is equal to the number 1. And what that implies for us with antiderivatives is that if I had a function f of x equals 1, right? So if f of x was equal to this number 1, then its antiderivative, capital F of x, would have to be the function whose derivative is equal to 1. Well, we just said that the function whose derivative is equal to 1 must be x. So uh, if f of x was equal to 1, then the antiderivative is simply equal to x. And that, of course, is true because the derivative of x is 1. The derivative of the antiderivative that we just established is equal to the original function that we started with. Now we do have to be careful here because let's think of this example. What if I had f of x as x plus 1? Well, what's the derivative of that? Now using this new notation, here's our antiderivative, capital F. So the derivative of capital F is equal to lowercase f. Well, what's the derivative of x plus 1? Well, that's also 1. What if our antiderivative, what if capital F was x plus 2? Well, what's the derivative of x plus 2? And that's also equal to 1. So what's interesting about these antiderivatives is that there's not just one answer. In fact, there's an infinite number of answers. As long as there's a constant added or subtracted from the what we call parent function, then the derivative of any of those family of functions will also be the original function. And so what we'll say is that this antiderivative, this capital F of x, is not only x, but it's x plus some unknown constant. This plus c will account for any of the additional constants added or subtracted from the parent function. So let's think about this next example. The derivative of x squared we know is 2x. That's thinking forward using our derivative notation from earlier this semester. The derivative of x squared is 2x. So the antiderivative of 2x must be x squared. 
but not just x squared, but x squared plus c, some unknown constant. Because the derivative of x squared, of course, is 2x. The derivative of x squared plus 1 is 2x. The derivative of x squared minus 1 is still 2x. There are a bunch of functions whose derivative is equal to 2x, but they all look very similar. They start with x squared, and we would add to that some unknown constant. And for our last example right now, we should recall that the derivative of sine of x is cosine of x, often written without the grouping symbol, so we'll just do that to be consistent here. So the derivative of sine is cosine, therefore the antiderivative of cosine is sine plus c. Now it may seem trivial at first to add c to all of these antiderivatives, um, and, it, and it will be easy for, uh, for you to forget, but it is very important to actually include this plus c, uh, because that helps us understand the differences between derivatives and antiderivatives. And also, um, later questions do um, provide enough information for us to identify the specific c value. For right now, we're not going to solve for c, we're not going to identify what it is specifically, uh, we just like to include it uh, with all of our antiderivatives. And so, <clears throat> again, to summarize, we call this the family of antiderivatives. If we're given a function, lowercase f, and find its antiderivative, capital F, we always uh, tack on this plus c, because c being any constant, any numerical value, can be added or subtracted from the antiderivative and still the derivative of that antiderivative would be the original function f that we started with. So I'd like to challenge you for a, a couple moments here. Uh, we have three functions in front of us and I would like for you to find the antiderivative. What function has a derivative equal to 3x squared? Please pause the video and resume playback in a moment to check your work. Well, this first one shouldn't be too bad because uh, x cubed, its derivative would be 3x squared. So therefore, the antiderivative of 3x squared is x cubed. And of course, we add c because we don't know the arbitrary constant that goes with it, or non-arbitrary constant, I should say. So we could confirm our answer pretty easily. The derivative of capital F is equal to the original function, which of course is 3x squared plus 0, or in other words, just 3x squared. So there's a good way to check. What about part B? Now here's a hint. Do you still have your derivative rules memorized? Pause the video now and resume playback in a moment to check your work. So this one may have been a bit unfair because this was technically a derivative rule that we didn't memorize, but we had recorded on our note card. Let's see if we can jump back to it here. Uh, this was at the end of uh, Unit 2, Part 1. Uh, here we have the 1 plus x squared. That's the resulting function. So therefore, the function whose derivative produced this result, well, this guy here, tangent inverse of x, that's the function that produced this derivative. Therefore, the antiderivative of 1 over x squared plus 1 is indeed tangent inverse of x. Now, of course, we have to include the plus c here because any constant value added to tangent inverse would produce a derivative equal to 1 plus x squared. So the derivative of capital F is equal to the function f of x, and the derivative of tangent inverse is 1 over x squared plus 1. The derivative of c is 0, and so here we have it. And of course, for those of you that may be concerned, um, since addition is commutative, <clears throat> 1 plus x squared is, of course, the same as x squared plus 1. Not necessarily true with subtraction, order does matter there, but as far as addition goes, we're okay. Now what about this last example? What is the antiderivative of sine of x? Pause the video and resume playback in a moment to check your work. Now the antiderivative of sine is the opposite 
of cosine, negative cosine. And this um, sometimes confuses students at first because they remember that the derivative of sine is equal to cosine. And so when they see the antiderivative, they forget that it was the derivative of cosine that equaled negative sine. Well, if our derivative was equal to a positive sign, then the antiderivative must have been negative cosine in order for that to happen. So that's why we're going to go with negative cosine here, because the derivative of negative cosine is positive sine x, or if you would like to think of it as negative 1 as our coefficient times negative sine of x plus c which of course negative 1 times negative sine becomes positive sine of x and oops this shouldn't be c here the derivative of this function derivative of c is 0 and so there we go uh, sine of x is what we have left and that's indeed what we started with so as far as our solutions go for each of these problems these are our answers and the work below was just used to confirm our results. And our answers were actually provided to us on this handout. They were in plain sight. Uh, you can see the solutions down here, x cubed plus c, tangent inverse plus c, and negative cosine plus c. Uh, so you may have noticed that, but what may have also thrown you off is this new symbol here. Well, this new symbol, it's kind of like a script S, these are the symbols, or this is the symbol that we use to imply antiderivatives. So much like we would use d over dx, um, this symbol implied uh, derivative, or basically told you to find the derivative of a function. The uh, script here, this symbol here, tells us to find the antiderivative. And the other thing that I'll point out, too, is that <clears throat> this d over dx um, phrasing was, was used to find the derivative. It's this antiderivative symbol. It also includes a dx as well. And so if we think about the full antiderivative symbol, it might look something like this, antiderivative of dx. And the function that's written inside the grouping symbol here, sometimes we show the parentheses and sometimes we don't. Uh, this is our command to find the antiderivative of whatever is on the inside of that grouping symbol. So in between this script S and the DX, this is what we're being asked to find the antiderivative of. And much like the beginning of our class, um, there are several antiderivative rules that we will uh, learn to memorize in addition to the derivative rules that we've learned. Uh, before we go any farther, though, I forgot to mention this, too. Uh, another phrase that we sometimes use for antiderivatives is indefinite integrals. We're going to learn more about integrals a little bit later, perhaps by the end of this week even. But there are such things as definite integrals and indefinite integrals. This indefinite integral is associated with this script sign as well. Uh, so this indefinite integral is just another way for us to ask for the antiderivative. So if you're doing some search or research on your own, uh, if you search for antiderivative rules or indefinite integral rules, uh, you should turn up the same results. So what we're being told here is that the antiderivative with respect to x of some power function, x to the power p, is equal to x to the power of p plus 1, not minus 1, as the power rule for derivatives stated. But we add a value to the power. And instead of multiplying by the exponent, we actually divide by the exponent. And hopefully that's starting to make sense. If we're performing the opposite operation, we're not going to decrease the exponent. But instead, we're going to increase it. And we're not going to multiply by the exponent as far as our uh, front coefficient goes. And instead, we're going to divide by that new exponent as indicated here. 
Now, of course, this rule will work for any p value as long as p is not equal to negative 1. And by the way, if x was raised to the negative first power, that would be equal to 1 over x. We have our own derivative rule for that. Sorry, we have our own function that produces this as a derivative. Perhaps you can imagine it. And the function that produces 1 over x as its derivative is uh, unlike these power values. We'll see that a little bit later as well. So this power rule can be used for any exponent as long as the exponent value p is not negative 1. So let me just give you an example. Uh, find the antiderivative of 6x to the 8th power with respect to x. Now we didn't talk about it yet, but we will in the theorem below. This constant multiple works just like the constant multiple rule for derivatives. So I'll kick that thing out to the left-hand side, and now we have the antiderivative of x to the 8th power with respect to x. So now instead of 6 times x squared, I've got 6 times the integral of x, sorry, not x squared, but x to the 8th power. Uh, now that I have some base, some um, variable that's acting as the base raised to the power of 8, then the antiderivative rule would give me uh, x to the 8 plus 1 divided by 8 plus 1. And we can, of course, clean this up and call this 6 times x to the 9th power over 9. And if we, oops, I'm forgetting something here. It's easy to forget this. Plus c, of course. And this, again, would be um, 6x to the 9th power over 9 plus c. Now, since c is some arbitrary constant, uh, it's not necessary that we multiply 6 times this c and report it as 6c. Whether we call this c or 6c or anything else uh, is not necessary to, to identify the difference between the two. So just the letter C is fine. And uh, we can clean this up just a little bit since the fraction 6 over 9 reduces to 2 thirds. So we can call this 2x to the 9th over 3, or as I reported here, 2 thirds x to the 9th power plus C. So I'm fairly confident that that's the derivative, but let's go ahead and, I'm sorry, that's the antiderivative, but let's go ahead and check our work by finding the derivative of 2 thirds x to the 9th power plus C. Well, this is a power rule for derivatives, so what we need here is 2 thirds times 9. Uh, the power of 9 gets reduced by 1 to become 8, and the derivative of c is, of course, 0. Even if it was 6c, we would still call that 0 because 6 times a number is still a number, and the derivative of a number is just 0. Well, 9 times 2 is 18, 18 divided by 3 is 6, and by golly, there we have it. The derivative of 2 thirds x to the 9th power plus c is indeed 6 times x to the 8th power, which is what we started with. So I'm very confident in saying that the antiderivative of 6 times x to the 8th power is 2 thirds x to the 9th power plus c. So that seems kind of tricky and a bit unusual, but I'm certain that the more we practice, the better we're going to get. Uh, so let me just throw in a couple other rules that uh, may seem to be true and are indeed true. Uh, we have the constant multiple rule that we just talked about. If we're trying to find the antiderivative of a function with respect to x, uh, where we have a constant that multiplies by a function, we can remove that constant or move it to the outside ignore it for the time being, and then focus on the antiderivative of that particular function. So that's perfectly fine. That's a legitimate uh, process. That is a rule for differentiation, anti-differentiation. And also the sum rule is true. If you're finding the antiderivative of the sum of two functions, then you could find the antiderivative of each function separately, and that would be just fine. The difference rule also holds true. Um, imagine that we had a minus sign. Well, you could treat that as plus a, excuse me, negative 1 times g to the x power, or uh, g of x. And if negative 1 acts as your constant, then you would have a negative 1 times the derivative. And when you add a negative 1 times something, that's essentially the same as subtracting. 
So we could also call this the sum or difference rule. So let's try these out with some examples down below. Um, here we're being asked to find the antiderivative of this function. Now this function is broken up by addition and subtraction signs, so we can use the sum or difference rules to split this up into three, and so that's what I'm going to do first. I'm going to say the, and I'm going to give myself lots of room here, so the antiderivative of 3x to the fifth power with respect to x plus the antiderivative of 2 with respect to x minus the antiderivative of 5x to the negative 3 halves power with respect to x. So it is important to include this differential, this dx, after each antiderivative. That would be the appropriate uh, notation here. So we only needed one antiderivative when the function was all grouped together, but as we separate these into individual functions, uh, then each one receives the differential as part of our notation. Um, at this point, just to be abundantly clear, I'm going to take this coefficient because of our constant multiple rule and write that outside. So the antiderivative of x to the fifth with respect to x plus the antiderivative of 2 with respect to x minus 5 times the antiderivative of x to the negative 3 halves power with respect to x. So here we go with the antiderivative. Well, I'm going to leave this 3 out front, and I'm going to focus on the power rule on the interior. The power rule says we take that power and increase it by 1, and then we divide by that new exponent, whatever 5 plus 1 is. And if you're familiar or comfortable enough with it by now, that's perfectly fine if we change this to x to the 6th over 6 plus c. Can't forget our plus c. Uh, the antiderivative of 2 would be 2x plus c, because the derivative of 2x is 2. And then finally, minus 5 times, okay, so here let's think about this. The power rule says we increase this power by 1, so that brings us up to negative 1 half. So we're at negative 3 halves. We add 1 to that, that's a negative 1 half. And then we divide by negative one-half immediately, plus c. And we can take some time cleaning this up. Uh, 3x to the sixth power over 6. I'm going to collect all of my c values and just write them one time at the very end here. Because again, 3c plus c plus or minus negative 5c, the c values are arbitrary anyway, so we'll just report it one time at the very end. Um, so we've got 3x to the 6th power over 6, 3x to the 6th power over 6, plus 2x minus 5x to the negative 1 half power divided by negative 1 half, and then plus c at the end. We can, of course, continue to clean this up, and we should. Uh, 3 over 6 reduces to 1 half, so I might call this 1 half x to the sixth power plus 2x. Now negative 5, I'm going to treat this negative sign up here, negative 5 divided by a negative 1 half, well those two negatives are going to combine to make positive. And 5 divided by a half is the same as 5 times 2, so I'm going to say 10, and this is x to the negative 1 half power plus c. And I'll probably leave that answer as it is. The original problem contained a negative rational exponent, uh, but you may also recognize this as a square root. The one-half power is a square root, and since it's negative, it shows up in the denominator of a fraction. So if fractions are your thing, you might write this as x squared over 2 plus 2x plus 10 over the square root of x plus c, and that would be acceptable as a result as well. I think both are equally as good. So that's pretty interesting, going through the power rule and utilizing our uh, sum and difference rules as well, we were able to find the antiderivative. Now of course you can check your work by finding the derivative of this expression, and that might be easier to do here. So if you want to check your work, find the derivative of this and ensure that it does produce this result. 
On Part B, I'll give you a, a hint or a reminder here that when you have a common divisor or a common value in our denominator, we can essentially split this thing up into two fractions. And so the antiderivative of this single fraction could be the same as the antiderivative of 4x to the 19th over x squared minus 5x to the negative 8th over x squared. Okay, the common divisor works like this. A common numerator does not. So you can't split this up if the roles were reversed. If we had x squared over 4x to the 19th minus or plus 5x to the negative 5th, you couldn't split that up and say x squared over this and x squared over that. That would be incorrect. That's not a safe assumption. But when there's a common divisor, that is entirely true. Now from here, I would probably simplify before computing the antiderivatives, and I might even use the uh, sum rule here. So we've got 4x to the 19th power over x squared. That would be the same as 4x to the 17th power with respect to x, and 5x to the negative 8th power divided by x squared. Well, that would be negative 5x to the negative 10th power with respect to x, and we can go from here. And depending on your comfort level, it might take a couple more steps to get here, but I'm looking at uh, these as the result for the antiderivatives. Uh, notice that I didn't write plus c for each one individually at this point, but I did collect and add the c at the very end here. Uh, your intermediate work along the way would probably have shown plus c for each of these two components, and uh, when you recognize that that's a single c value at the very end, that would be just fine. Now here again, 4 is going to multiply in and simplify the fraction 4 over 18. That's going to make 2 ninths x to the 18th power. Uh, the division of 5, uh, negative 5 and negative 9 turns into a plus, and that's 5 ninths x to the negative 9th power plus c, and I would probably call that a good answer, again, because our original problem had negative exponents in it. If our original problem did not contain negative exponents, then I would take this a step further and call this maybe 2x to the 18th power over 9 plus 5 over 9x to the 9th power plus c. And that would be a good answer to report as well. Now in this final example, we don't really have a derivative, antiderivative rule yet to account for this opposite of the product rule. Recall that when finding the derivative of the product of two functions, it wasn't just the derivative of the first times the derivative of the second. There was that whole product rule that had the sum of two different calculations. And so similarly, we would encounter that here as well, the antiderivative of the product of two functions is not just the antiderivative of the, I'm sorry, not the product of the antiderivatives. So I think what would be beneficial here is to foil this together and then find the antiderivative of each of these individual functions. And here again, uh, this result I think would be good, but it's very easy to check. If we were to find the derivative of this expression, we end up with, well, 4 times a half is 2x cubed. 3 times negative 5 thirds is negative 5x squared. 2 times x minus 5 plus 0. The derivative of c is 0. And how does this compare to the original? Well, I think it's pretty good because that's exactly what we had here when we foiled it. So the answer, of course, is not inclusive of this black ink, just the red ink before we checked our work. And I'd be very happy with that. This black ink was just used to check our work. Now to finish out this video, let's do some antiderivatives of trigonometric functions. And I do want to point out here that we're not going to memorize our antiderivative rules like we did our derivative rules. Um, to be perfectly honest, when we 
calculate antiderivatives, a lot of times we're just going to be referencing a table of antiderivatives or a table of indefinite integrals. These are available in most textbooks. Um, there are nice um, consolidated lists online that you can reference as well. And so we will do that here. Uh, but let's go ahead and find how to find or find the antiderivative of secant squared of 3x. Now you may be familiar with secant squared of x, that may look familiar to you, but what happens when there's an arbitrary multiplier or some sort of constant multiplier inside of that argument? Well, to use this table, what we're gonna look for is this pattern, secant squared of something times x, which I found it right here. Secant squared of something times x would simply be one over that something times tangent of that something times x plus c. And we know that this is going to be the derivative, be, or I'm sorry, the antiderivative because of our derivative rule that existed prior to this. The derivative of tangent is secant squared, and if we use essentially the chain rule with that, uh, where we have a multiplier inside of the grouping symbol, uh, we'll um, find the derivative of tangent with respect to that a times x, and then multiply by the derivative of a to the x, which is just a on the exterior. And so because of this derivative rule, we have this antiderivative rule that we've used for part a. And by the way, most antiderivative lists don't contain this left-hand side. That's just here to, to kind of drive home the points. If this left-hand side were gone and we just had this list here on the right, uh, that would be a list of indefinite indefinite integrals that we use often in class. And for this last example, let's treat this x over 2 as 1 half times x, and now our a value is a half. What's the antiderivative of cosine? Well, here we are here. The antiderivative of cosine is not negative sine, it's not a derivative, but it's an antiderivative. So the antiderivative of cosine is just regular old sine, and we'll say 1 over 1 half because our a value, our a value is a half. So we want 1 over a times sine of 1 half x plus c. And of course, we would clean this up and call this 2 times sine of 1 half x plus c. To confirm this result, we could find the derivative, and we can do this for the first example as well. Uh, but to find the derivative, well, the derivative of this expression is going to be 2 times whatever the derivative of sine is. The derivative of sine is cosine. Since we have a multiplier on the interior, we're going to leave that alone following our chain rule. So the derivative of the outside, we keep the inside alone. Then we multiply by the derivative of the inside. And to that, we'll add the derivative of c, which is 0. 2 times a half, of course, is just 1. And what we're left with is cosine of 1 half x plus 0 is nothing. And this cosine of 1 half x certainly is what we started with back here. So we know that this answer was good after all. So I hope that helps um, with this introduction to antiderivatives. For extra practice, you can look in Chapter 4, Section 9, Numbers 1 through 46 for additional practice. You can find those on Math Excel, or if I create a PDF copy of the end of our chapter from the textbook, uh, you can look at it as well for further practice. If you have questions along the way, please let me know, or if you try anything else on your own and would like confirmation, uh, you can reach out to me as well. Thanks for watching.